Hey everyone, I recently picked up this refrigeration unit at a surplus sale and just got it working last night. So I thought I'd talk about what I learned about the system and how I got it working. This unit is called a cold trap and the idea is that this chamber here gets down to about negative 100 degrees C and you connect your vacuum line to this glass chamber here and submerge this in alcohol to help uh, conduct the cold temperatures into the glass vessel. And then as you're pumping down a system with your vacuum pump, uh, it's so cold on the exterior of this chamber that all the impurities in your vacuum line will get uh, condensed, solidified into here and won't go into your vacuum pump. In a basic phase change refrigeration system, we have a high pressure side and a low pressure side. And the two sides are divided by the compressor itself and a restriction here. And this is very often a capillary tube so if you ever look into a refrigerator and see a coil of small diameter copper tubing, it's most likely serving as this resistance between the high pressure side and the low pressure side. So the way the system works is the compressor raises the pressure here, and when we extract heat from that compressed gas, it condenses to a liquid, which gets sent over to the cold side of the system. And since the pressure is lower over here, that liquid will now evaporate, uh, turn back to a gas, and complete the cycle. So we get a large amount of heat moved from here to here, and we're making use of that phase change point in the refrigerant. So what if we want to make a system that gets very cold? What if we want negative 100 degrees C here? How come the system doesn't just get colder and colder as it's moving heat from here to here? The answer is that uh, it depends on the fluid properties of the refrigerant. So if the refrigerant itself boils at uh, negative 40 degrees C at a very, very low pressure, it almost doesn't matter how good the compressor is. Once this cold side gets down to negative 40 or a little bit below, that liquid is not going to want to evaporate and we're not going to get much more heat transferred. Now you could say, well, I just want you know, a bigger and bigger compressor and I'll just make the, the pressure lower and lower here and eventually that liquid will boil because we can always get the, pre the pressure arbitrarily low enough but it becomes a, a hugely diminishing return. And the bigger the ratio of compression across your compressor, the lower the efficiency of the whole system. So if we want a negative 100 degree C refrigerator, it's very impractical to do it with a single refrigerant like this, just because for a given material, our compression ratio would have to be enormously high to make it work. Like for example, if we had a substance that was um, that boiled at negative 150 degrees C so that we could still have a phase change here, the pressure ratio might have to be 50 or 100 to 1. And that makes uh, other parts of the system difficult too, since now the copper tubing here has to be thick enough to handle the really high pressure over here, and the compressor has to be extremely over spec to have uh, such a really high compression ratio across it. So one solution to this problem, but not the only one, is to break our job into two pieces. So this is called a two-stage refrigeration system or a cascade refrigeration system. And the idea is that the first stage will take us down from room temperature to an intermediate low temperature, and we can select a refrigerant that boils at an appropriate point for that. And then we'll have a second stage refrigeration system that takes us from that intermediate pressure down to the very low pressures, and we can choose a different refrigerant for that which is better tuned for that uh, really low temperature operation. So essentially we've taken that massive compression ratio and spread it across two different compressors, in fact two different systems with different refrigerants. In this case the condenser in this cold trap unit operates at you know above ambient probably 40 or 50 degrees C. The heat exchanger where the two systems join together is maintained at about negative 15 degrees C or even negative 20 or 25. And then the cold side is about negative 100 degrees C. So the manual spec these two refrigerants that should be used in the system. However, there's a decal on the side of the unit that actually says it's charged with R1150. And uh, I'll show you in a minute that I opened the system up and found evidence that it looks like it has the refrigerant had been changed in it. I should also note that in most refrigeration systems, the amount of refrigerant in the system is usually stated in terms of mass. So if you go to charge your car with R134A, uh, it'll say it needs, you know, one and a half kilograms or something like that. And the reason is that when you add it to your car, 
at the pressures required to have it in the system at ambient pressures, there will be a gas liquid mix inside there. So you can't really just measure it. You can't measure the amount of stuff in the system just by checking the pressure because the pressure will always be the same until you completely fill the system with liquid because there's this equilibrium between the gas and the liquid in there. In these low temperature systems, the refrigerant is always a gas at ambient temperatures and pressures within the system, the, the baseline pressure. So if we know the ambient uh, temperature, we can use a gauge just to figure out how much substance is in the system just because it's uh, linearly related, just because it's a, a gas at all times. So here we can see the two compressors. This is the first stage and this is the second stage compressor. Uh, here you can see the capillary tube, the restriction in the first stage uh, system, which is here. Uh, this is actually another capillary tube, but that's not the uh, restriction in the second stage system. It's actually this tiny oil return line. And so the trick is that there's an oil separator and there needs to be a restriction to keep all the pressure from going back through this oil return line to the compressor. So that's what this small line is here going back to here. That's just uh, to get the oil out of the system. The heat exchanger itself is buried inside the styrofoam uh, shield unit and the, the cold side is actually wrapped around the stainless chamber here. So when I first turned the unit on, the front panel indicated that the heat exchanger temperature was correctly down to about negative 15 degrees C, and both compressors were running, but the cold side of the unit was not getting cold at all. I mean, it wasn't even going uh, even a few degrees below ambient. Uh, and both compressors were running, and so all the electrics seemed fine. So that really narrows it down to just two problems. There's either a blockage in the second stage system or there's a leak. After I took the unit apart, I noticed that there was an aftermarket uh, clamp on sort of vampire tap on one of the fill ports for the second, sta second stage system. Uh, this is almost certainly not a factory uh, piece. And since the manual specs a chlorinated fluorocarbon for the second stage refrigerant, but there's a decal on the side of the unit that says R1150, which is ethylene gas, I'm guessing that at some point in this unit's history, someone replaced the second stage refrigerant. Uh, now, it's understandable to use one of those vampire tap things to remove refrigerant because there's no other way of sort of breaking into the system. There's no ports on it. See, the only way that we can remove gas is by using one of those vampire taps. The problem is that they, they leak, and so you can't really use that as a permanent solution. So uh, my plan of action here was to cut off the vampire tap and replace it with uh, a more standard connector. So this still has a Schrader valve inside there so that we can fill and then you know remove gas later and fill it again. But there's no um, seal to the outside of the copper pipe. So basically it's a, a solder on type of system. And then once the valve is installed, uh, there's a much more controlled rubber seal there, whereas with the Vampire Tap, it's, it's not as easy to seal to the outside of the copper pipe. First, I wanted to check if there was any remaining gas in there, and so I put a gauge on the existing tap there, and it, it couldn't even move the needle off the peg, but I could feel a little bit of gas coming out when just putting my finger over the valve. Uh, so I filled up a small uh, bit of rubber glove with it and tested to see if it was combustible, just to see if it was R1150, or a non-flammable gas, and yes, it, it actually did light up, so that was uh, slightly encouraging there. Um, second, since I wanted to do hot work on the system and basically uh, solder on a new fitting, I wanted to get all that flammable gas out of there and replace it with argon. So I hooked the system up to my manifold and pumped it down with a vacuum pump and then filled the system back up with argon and let it sit at about 40 or 50 PSI for a day or two just to see if there were still any remaining major leaks. Everything looked good, so I uh, set up the manifold again and this time connected a tank of ethylene to it. Now this tank is actually the most difficult thing that I think I've ever purchased in my entire shop. I've spent tens of hours tracking down this cylinder of gas. Uh, and had I known where to go in the first place, it wouldn't have been so bad, but needless to say, this was really, really a challenging thing to find. There's very little information available online regarding these ultra-low temperature refrigeration units, and since the manual spec an entirely different refrigerant for this unit, I really had no way of knowing exactly what pressure to uh, you know, add the ethylene. 
So I basically just chose 100 PSI since that seemed like a good round number and it was um, close to most of the uh, bits of data that I could actually pull out of the internet. The system has been running for about an hour and as you can see uh, the front panel indicates negative 102 degrees C and when it puts the decimal points up that's indicating the heat exchanger temperature so negative 18 degrees C at the heat exchanger and as you can see there's uh, a bunch of ice crystals and perhaps condensation here just putting my hands enough to cause a lot of convection current I don't know if you can see that moving the, uh, the fog around. It's quite cold. It's colder than dry ice. So um, if we pumped CO2 in there, it would actually form uh, dry ice. I plan to use this thing as a cold trap, but also to play with uh, you know, cold temperatures in general. So wherever you have to use dry ice, you could use this instead and not, not need to make the trip to the store. Okay. See you next time. Bye.